This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Isn't that a whole lot different than this? Uh, let's take this out of context. What, now, now, because you're a Christian and, and if you have enough faith, you can ask God for a billion, billion, billion dollars and He's going to give it to you because you're going to have whatever you ask in the name of, of Jesus, not even understanding. Bearing no understanding of what it means to carry the name of God and who we represent. Let's go to Mark chapter 16, verses 14 through 20. This is part of the Great Commission, and I understand that many scholars and textual criticism consider this a, 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 an, an interpolation, which means there is a real possibility that was this scribe's notes to themselves. You know how I'll write on the side of my Bible and write notes and stuff? It may have been that somewhere in the, in the second, third, or fourth century, somebody may have written this into their own, to their own scrolls as they were putting it together. But at the same time, it also shows us the mindset of the church in the first and second century. And so if, if Mark did not write that, this, this is what they heard, and this was the mindset. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. And the interpolation starts next. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Now that semicolon is not there in the Greek. That's English. So this can literally read, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Okay. They shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God, and they went forth preaching everywhere, and the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs and wonders. Those that believe in the name learn to function within the name and the character of the one whose name it belongs to. So if you're functioning, the secret to casting out devils is learning to live in the name. The secret to laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover is learning how to function in the name. Now this is not about snake handling. I mean, you know that Jesus said, you know, the, if you pick up any serpent, he already had identified when he said, lo, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He called the demonic forces snakes and scorpions. So they understood in that context it had nothing to do with picking up rattlesnakes, had nothing to do with, with picking up copperheads or whatever. And also within that time frame, the easiest way and the most efficient way they used to kill an enemy was they poisoned them. Because it's very hard to trace back who did it. 
It's very common within, within the Roman society that poison was the murder weapon of choice. That's why they would even, wealthy households would even have food tasters. And many times the cook in front of the, the, the family that they served would have to eat of the food first before they served it to make sure that their, their slave cook did not poison them to death. And there's no telling how many times, because it's probably not recorded in Scripture because the apostles did not know how many times along the way somebody had poisoned them and it just never took hold and it went on. But notice they're doing it all in the name of Jesus. That when you walk in the power of that name, you have to respect the name and have that name hallowed before the power is released in our lives. Now let's go on to Acts chapter 4. Twenty-three. Now to set this back in context, some of the apostles have been going about healing and casting out demons in the name of Jesus. They were drugged before the Sanhedrin. They were beaten. And what they were told is, go ahead and heal and cast out demons. Just don't do it in the name of Jesus. And so they go back and they give their report back to the church, okay? We pick up here in verse 23. And being let go, they went there to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Oh, Lord, it's rough down here. We're going to have to quit preaching in your name. We're going to have to quit healing in your name. Because now they got our numbers. Is that what the word says here? <laughs> no, it doesn't. And it says, and, thou, and uh, Lord, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the seas and all that is the, of them that is, whom by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers are gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word and stretch forth thy hand to heal, that signs and wonders be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. See, it's all about the name. It's all about living within the power of the name and the concept of the name. Lord, they told us to back down and quit carrying the name and displaying the power of the name. And so our thing is grant us boldness that we would do it even more. Now why? Why do that? Because the religious leaders of the day were not carrying the name of God and were not displaying any power, were not displaying anything of the kingdom at all. And so they said, for the sake of the people. Just like in the ministry of Jesus, they got a good argument, but they ain't got no power. Jesus had a great argument, but he could display kingdom power. And if we're going to be like him, we've got to know the word. We've got to be able to reason with people and have a good argument. But when, when there comes a time where the arguments stop and the power's got to start. And so grant us to be more bold about the name. To carry the name in the earth. So what's God's response to all this? He sent down an angel to comfort them and said, just duck and cover. Is that what we see here? No, we don't. It said, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak the Word of God with boldness. Oh, that's the way it's to be. But notice heaven's response. You needed 
a refilling of the Holy Spirit. And what precipitated the, the refilling of the Holy Spirit? Was it seeking the refilling of the Holy Spirit? Or was it saying, make His name holy in the earth? That's the prescription for a refilling of the Holy Spirit is being worried about God's reputation, about power being manifested in His name, and for Him to become famous, for His name to be held out so that the Gentiles no longer blaspheme the name of God, but they honor the name of God by the way that we're conducting ourselves. When our prayer life begins to turn that way, there will always be a fresh infilling. Do you guys see that there? But the church today is repeating the error of the Second Temple Jewish people. In fact, there's a story of St. Francis of Assisi that he made his pilgrimage to Rome and the Pope of the time was showing him all the great treasures that the church had amassed, going all the way back to, to what was there from uh, the, the booty that the Roman soldiers had gotten during the exploits of Rome. All it ended up going to the Vatican Church. In fact, the Vatican Church to this day still has the great menorah that was taken out when the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. They still have it to this day. And so the Pope is walking around and he's showing St. Francis of Assisi all the wealth of the church. And the Pope jokingly says, I guess we can't be like the Apostle Peter anymore and say, silver and gold have I none. And Francis' response when he looked at Rome and looked at the corruption and looked at all the gold, he said, and neither can we say in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. It's not in silver and gold. It's in the name. Okay. Mark chapter 13, starting in verse 5. And Jesus answered them, began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. Now how are they going to deceive us? For shall many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now there's several ways of reading this. Many will come and say, okay, I have this Messiah spirit and I'm the Christ. We've had our, we have had plenty of that with, with many new age Christs and, and many ones coming in. But I think the primary reading of this is Jesus is saying, listen, in the days ahead, there are going to be many come in my name and they're going to say that I'm actually the Christ. But then they're going to present to you another Jesus and deceive many. How many versions of Jesus do we have represented in the church today? You can go denomination by denomination and movement by movement and have a different representation of who Jesus is. None of them take the time to put him back in the historical, cultural, and biblical significance. Now, I think that's part of what God was trying to do with the Hebraic Roots movement. And so much of the Hebraic Roots movement have all of a sudden fallen in love with Judaica. They have forgotten about Jesus. And to quote one famous rabbi, he said, the way they conduct themselves, they're like Jewish wannabes. Because it's all about the kippa and the zitzi and the shofar. And, and, and I, I've literally seen guys debating on, on how long are your zitzi on your tali. If you're dragging them behind you, it's too long. And for a Gentile, if you're using it beyond the prayer closet, you shouldn't. You need to show man that you're walking in the commandments by the way you live and the attitude of your heart. And that you have completely been entwined with Messiah in your life 
and you literally become a walking zitzi by the way that you live, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we've got to take Jesus back into context and present Him as the God of the Hebrews come in the flesh. We're not getting into Marcionism that Jesus is a separate God from Elohim of the Old Testament. And then Marcion went on to say that Jesus conquered the God of the Old Testament because the God of the Old Testament was harsh. You want to see harsh, wait till Jesus gets ready to come back. You're going to see some harsh because he's coming back to judge. We can extend the grace of God while teaching the commandments of God for those who have been saved. Why is that so necessary? You can't outdo your disobedience to God after you get saved. And grace will only cover it for so long. What do you mean by that? New baby, just learning to walk. They have, they, have to, they have to develop to a cognizant level to where they understand yes and no. Before then, they don't. And so what does a mom and dad do? A mom and dad runs after them constantly, keeping them from killing themselves or hurting themselves or getting into trouble because they're not old enough to understand but I recently saw a progressive commercial that kind of represents a lot of the church today. And the scene comes in where you, you see a grocery cart and the mom's shopping groceries and, and you have the little place where you put the kid in front and there's a 30-year-old sitting there. And so as she's pulling it through the store, he's picking things up and throwing it off uh, onto the floor of the grocery store. And the end of the commercial is, act your age and get your own insurance. It's the spirit of this age, and it's not only an indictment to what the progressives had done to the youth, when you have college people that if they hear something they don't like, they get into trauma and you have to give them crayons to color. Something's wrong with that. I read a report this week that... Uh, said after the 2016 election, this one professor said at least 60 to 70 percent of all the college students are going to develop PTSD because they were traumatized that Hillary didn't win. Well, if that's what it takes to traumatize you, go and talk to a, a, an SRA survivor what trauma is about. Or a rape victim or, or someone that their household was hell on earth. Go and, and, and tell them, go ask one of our vets what trauma is. That wasn't trauma. It may have been a disappointment, but it wasn't trauma. But that's the mindset, and the church is much like that. We're like that kid that's 30-some-odd years old sitting in the little kid's seat in the grocery cart, and we're still expecting God, because of His grace, to constantly clean up after us when He's saying, it's time for you to get out of that cart and for you to start making your blessing by walking in my ways. Because eventually a parent will quit running after them and start correcting them. And there's a lot of people right now that are wanting the church to pray that they would get set free from God's correction and they're thinking it's the devil doing it. We need to ask ourselves today, can Paul's claim that Israel made the Gentiles blaspheme God can that same can be applied to the church today? I think it can. There's no fear of the church today. There's no respect. People don't respect God. They don't respect men of God. There's no respect. It's for me what I want in the moment. And I see that, guys, all over the place. There are so many comments that I have to delete off of our blog of people that claim to be Christians that want to, whatever their fleshly thing is about, they want, to, they, want to, they want to vomit on everybody that goes to the website. Might as well quit because not a one of them is ever going to get posted. Everyone is screened. I've even had the Illuminati try to post recruitments up on our site. That ain't happening either because each one is reviewed and approved and it doesn't represent the Spirit of Christ. It's gone. Go puke somewhere else. 
because it's actually showing our lack of, of dedication and understanding of carrying the name. You see, the task of the remnant in our generation is that we have got to restore the name of God amongst ourselves and then in the earth. And then we have got to restore God's reputation in the earth by the way that we live, by the truth that we preach, and that in love we can refuse to compromise. That is when the power is going to begin really showing up in the church, is when it's all about Him, it's all about representing Him, it's all about the integrity of His name, His purpose, His kingdom, and that by His grace, I get to be a part of it. And my prayer life is controlled that way, the way that I preach is controlled that way, and the way that I walk in the commandments are controlled by the life and the majesty of Jesus in the earth. Well, Father, I come before you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask that you would challenge and change our attitudes. Let us be Jesus conscious. Let us, let us be zealous over his name. Zealous over his word. Zealous over his kingdom. All the kingdoms of men are going to pass away. The wealth of this world is transient. No matter how much we have, one day we're going to have to lay it down when we leave it all behind. But what we do carry to heaven is the name and the blood and the power and the grace and the kingdom of Jesus. And Father, let us be consumed with that and not let the devil get us off. Because that's the task of the remnant. That's the task of all of us in this day and this hour. And Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit would begin to activate in very powerful ways to correct, to adjust, and then to empower your kingdom in our lives. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the Remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious Church. It is time for the Remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand the Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering Heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken be empowered and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. 
Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.